I'm so proud of you. Thank you. I am too. Hey, Nugget, is this your podcast now? What do you have to say? Not much? Okay, we'll, we'll come back to you later. Hello, and welcome to a special Knitted by Whitney video. I am doing a special Ask Me Anything video to celebrate 1,000 subscribers! I am so excited to have gotten to this point, and I couldn't do it without all of you. So, we're popping some bubbly and celebrating, but my 1,000 subscribers are not the only thing that I want to cheers to. My friend Kendra of Balance Gain is also celebrating 1,000 subscribers, and she's also doing an Ask Me Anything video. So I don't know when hers will be up, whether mine will be up first or if hers will be up first, so I will link her channel below so you can give her a like and a follow. But for now, let's cheers. Cheers to you, Kendra, and cheers to all of you. Thank you so much for being on this journey with me. I am so excited for all of the successes that have happened on my channel and really excited to see what comes next. Cheers. As you can probably tell, there is no mug of the episode today. I am drinking out of a champagne glass. But if you like this glass, it's from Ikea. So go to Ikea, grab yourself a few. <laughs> now before I get into the questions, I have another surprise for you. This is also a giveaway episode. You didn't think I would let 1,000 subscribers come by and not do a giveaway, did you? I am very excited about the giveaway for this video because I am giving away a really special prize. First, I'm giving away some beautiful hand-dyed yarn from We Love Knitting, which is a company based out of Australia. Now, unfortunately, they no longer dye yarn. They are now primarily a pattern company but I thought this yarn was appropriate. I've had this in my stash for a while, but I wanted to give it away for this episode because the name of this yarn is, and I'm gonna try and pronounce this correctly, Eiskadai, which is Norwegian for love you. So I wanted to give away this beautiful yarn that says love you because I love all of you, my subscribers. Now to go with the yarn, I'm giving away a little stitch marker from A Needle Runs Through It. I have quite a few of their stitch markers and I absolutely love them. And this one is just a little one that says, all you knit is love. And I just, I love that. I think it's so cute. But to go with this yarn is going to be a project bag sewn by me. I haven't made the project bag yet, but I can show you the fabric that I'm going to use. I'm going to be using some of this really cute cat fabric for the main color, a little bit of purple for the accent, and then the inside is going to be this lovely pink. So although I haven't made the project bag yet, I can show you what it looks like because I've made quite a few of these for myself and I really love them. This is the most recent one that I've made. As you can see, it's just a little drawstring bag with some cotton ties and it just pulls open like this. It's a great size for doing socks, a hat, a cowl, scarf, shawl, beginnings of a sweater, anything. Right now I have my Laura sweater and I have the yoke and I've separated for the sleeves. So that's about what can fit into here and I don't think I need to change up my bag size yet. But I really love these. I've made quite a few of them and I'm gonna be making one for this giveaway. So all you need to do to enter the giveaway is be subscribed to my channel and comment on this video and include in your comment the words 1K giveaway, which I will include here on the screen so you know what to put. Now, if you wanna comment on this video but you don't want to be included in the giveaway, just don't include those words, that's it. I hope you like the prizes. I'm very excited about this giveaway. And like I mentioned in my past giveaway, dependent on where you live in the world, it might take a while for this to get to you because I have to mail it. So let's get into these questions, shall we? 
I was so impressed with the questions that I was asked. I was asked some really good questions and I'm really excited to answer these for you folks. Now, if more than one person asked me the same question, I would just lump them together. Starting with probably the most common question that I was asked, which is, how did I get into knitting? So I got into knitting in January of 2015. I started because I had seen the Hunger Games Catching Fire and I just fell in love with the knitted cowl slash vest thing that Katniss wears in one of the scenes. I'll show a picture right here. And to buy one ready-made was quite expensive. But when I did my search, I also found the Hunter Cowl pattern by Diana Burke. I'll put that here. And it was a lot more affordable than the finished item. So I thought to myself, well, I could learn to knit. That doesn't seem too hard. So I learned to knit. And this was not the first pattern that I did, of course. This was, funny enough, my second pattern, <laughs> which was still quite an advanced pattern for a beginner knitter, but I did it. And I'll show you my version right here. Of course, it wasn't perfect, and I wasn't experienced enough at the time to know how to do things properly, so I had the odd emotional breakdown, but I got through it. Um, however, <laughs> I didn't know how to seam properly. So I went to wear it and all the pieces just came right apart. The whole thing just fell apart and it was really sad. I didn't know how to save it. I didn't know how to fix it. So unfortunately I no longer have this item, but it is in the back of my mind to maybe remake one day. The next question is a bit of a two part. Someone asked me, what was the first project you ever made? And someone else asked, what was the first project you made that you still use? Which are two distinct questions. My very first project that I made was a cowl that it didn't really have a pattern. Um, it was just something that my aunt, who was quite a, quite a big knitter, told me about that she did herself. And it was just alternating um, two rows of knits, two rows of pearls using super bulky yarn. And then once you get the length that you like, you just bind off and then you seam it up the back. So that was a great way to start, but, and I got a lot of wear out of it, but I just, it wasn't really my thing after a while. So I ended up just donating it. But my first project that I ever made that I still have and still use, probably the fifth or sixth project that I made. And it's the Hollowmont hat. This was designed by Emily Walton. And I first found this pattern because uh, the yarn company Expression Fiber Arts used to always do a free pattern Friday on their Facebook page a couple years ago. And this was one of the patterns one week and I really liked it. I liked that it was basically a simple hat but it also had a bit of interest to it with this cool stitch pattern. And let me tell you, I wear this hat all the time. I love this hat. I think it's really comfortable, it's really cozy. It's just made out of some wool yarn that I found at Michael's one day, so it's not even anything fancy. Now, I'll show a picture here of what it looked like when I first finished it. I didn't have the pom-pom on at that time. Um, when I first finished it, I actually didn't know how to make pom-poms, so I didn't put a pom-pom on it. And it was fine like that. I could easily have left it like that. But when I learned how to make pom-poms a little later, I put a pom-pom on it because pom-poms are fun, right? And I kind of messed up my pom-pom a little bit by just making it really big. I don't think I would make such a thick pom-pom anymore. And also this one, uh, because it's pure wool, over the years it's kind of felted. So it's not really like individual pieces of a pom-pom anymore. It's just like this big clump of yarn. So it kind of pulls down on the hat. But that's okay, I wear it anyway. I love this hat, I think it's great. Following on the same trend, what was the first garment you knit? So the first garment that I ever knit was the Three Movie Sweater by Amy Cox. This is a bottom-up raglan sweater made out of super bulky yarn. And it's called the Three Movie Sweater because you're supposed to be able to finish it in about six hours, which is the equivalent of three movies. I started mine while watching a marathon rewatch of the Lord of the Rings movies, which 
I didn't do the extended cuts, I just did the regular ones, but those are already about eight or nine hours, so longer than three usual movies. I still didn't finish my sweater by the time that I finished The Return of the King, but I didn't expect to because I was a beginner knitter. I did, however, finish the body, and after that it was pretty simple to get the sleeves done up, and then I started doing the raglan construction on the yoke. I had never done a raglan before, and I didn't know how to do all of the stitches that I needed to do for this pattern. <laughs> I didn't know how to SSK or slip slip knit. And I didn't know that different decreases angle in different ways. So I thought I could get away with just doing knit two together on both sides of the raglan. <laughs> and I'll show you here, <laughs> it did not work out very well. <laughs> Um, uh, unfortunately for me, one side of my raglan looked great, the other side was angling into the armpit and it looked ridiculous. But I was so proud of this garment because it was the first sweater that I had ever knitted and I was just so excited about that. I wore that sweater all winter and I wore it so much that it started to stretch out, it started to pill. So at the end of the winter, I just donated it. It, it could go on to another life. I, I was ready to move on to. Um, so yeah, I, I don't have that sweater anymore. Oh well. The next question was another one that I was asked a few similar questions, so I just put them together. What's your favorite item to knit? What's your favorite project? And what's your favorite garment that you've knit so far this year? So to answer the first one, my favorite projects to do are hats and seamless sweaters. I just love them, they're my thing. My favorite project that I've ever knit is a tie because I have something that I made a long time ago and then I have something that I've made recently and they're both in equal places in my heart. So the first one is a costume that I knitted. I think it was a few, it was a few years ago now, maybe 2017, 2018. Tamora Pierce came to Nova Scotia to go to Halcon, and I'm a big Tamora Pierce fan. I love her books, especially the Song of the Lioness Quartet. So I knew that I wanted to cosplay as Alana, the main character of that series. And I knew the character wore chainmail because I was basing my cosplay off of the cover of the last book in the series, which is Lioness Rampant. And I didn't want to wear real chainmail because real chainmail is very heavy and it's also very expensive. So I thought to myself, why don't I knit chainmail? Obviously my first option was to find a pattern online, but I didn't really find one that I felt worked for what I had in mind. So I just came up with this. I made my own chainmail without a pattern. So I think I got really close to the, the inspiration for the pit for the costume. So I'll pop a picture of that right here. I was so proud of my costume. I felt that I looked amazing. I was really comfortable because I was just in yarn. I wasn't in metal from neck to knee. And my costume just turned out amazing. I had so many people around the con complimenting me and recognizing who I was because as a plus size person cosplaying, unless your costume is super, super accurate, sometimes people don't know who you are, which, you know, that's too bad. But I don't have the time or the budget to have super, like, detailed costumes that look identical to their source material. I just cosplay for fun because I like to dress up. So a lot of people at the con loved my costume including Tamora Pierce herself, because she signed in my book that she loved my costume. And this is probably one of my biggest highlights. I was so proud of that and so excited by that. Now my other favorite project is one that, I've talked about this as being one of my favorite projects, so you might know what I'm talking about. It's my Into the Woods jumper. I love this project. It's one of my favorites because not only do I love the finished product, 
I also really loved the process of making it from start to finish. It was my first ever colorwork sweater, and I was just amazed at how easy it was and how relaxing and meditative it was. I really enjoyed every minute of making that, and it looks beautiful. I love my yarn choices. I love my colors. Now for the last part of that question, my favorite garment that I've knit this year, it's obviously my souffle tee. I loved that project so much, and like I mentioned in my video where I reviewed the pattern, I thought it was one of the best testing experiences that I've ever had because Laura was so sweet and so supportive, and she just made us feel so welcomed and made us feel very appreciated, very valued, and it was generally a really lovely pattern to knit, so that was my favorite thing that I've made this year. At the other, at the other end of the spectrum, I was asked, what item do you refuse to knit? So this one's kind of funny because there's two things that I refuse to knit, but I've already knit them. And that's kind of why I refuse to knit them now. The first is socks. Um, I've talked a little bit about how much I don't like knitting socks. I know it's something that a lot of knitters like to do, but it just, it's not me, it's not my thing. But I have knit one pair of socks. They were for my, at the time, boyfriend Doyle, who is now my fiance and I knit them in secret last year and gave them to him for his birthday. And I talked a lot more about that in my episode, Boyfriend Knits, which I'll link below. Now, the other thing that I refuse to knit is an all over lace project. I'm somebody who loves the look of lace, but I don't want to put in the effort that it takes to make lace. I think it's absolutely beautiful, but it's so time consuming. And I personally find it really challenging to keep track of lace charts. But the hardest one that I ever made was the Ricoletta cardigan by Hohi Locatelli. It's a stunning cardigan, but it is really challenging because you have two different lace charts that you need to look at at the same time. There's the lace that goes all along the back of the sweater. And then there's also the lace panels that go at the front of the sweater. Now I made this for my mom for Christmas in 2020 and my mom loves black. So I knit it in black, which was also part of the problem. Um, but she absolutely loves it. She wears it all the time. She really appreciates it. It was worth it just to get that reaction out of my mom, but I will never knit an all over lace pattern again. It's just too challenging for me. The next question is, what's your favorite go-to yarn to work with? So I actually don't typically use the same yarns more than once. I am like a magpie. I'm always attracted to something new. I love a lot of variety, but I do have a couple yarns that are my favorites that I would definitely use again. Um, I would definitely use Woolies Thick and Quick. It's one of my favorite um, super bulky yarns. I would use... Shiboy Knits Reed, which I used for my Elizabeth Bennett linen tee, which I did a video about, and I'll link that below. And I would use Fleece Artist Vine, which I used for my Into the Woods jumper. And I would use pretty much any yarn from Knit Picks. I'm a big Knit Picks fan, and I actually don't see a lot of knitting podcasters talking about Knit Picks yarn or using Knit Picks yarn. I don't know if maybe they don't know about it, or it's just not their thing. But I love Knit Picks. I love that they offer really good quality yarns for a very affordable price. And with the odd exception, I've always been super happy with the yarns that I've bought from them. So my favorites that I've used have been Stroll. That's my absolute favorite Knit Picks yarn. Um, City Tweed and Alpaca Cloud Lace, which I used for my souffle tea. Speaking of yarn, someone asked me, fingering weight forever or chunky forever? Now I'm surprising myself by saying this, but I would go fingering because even though I don't like using small yarn and small needles, there's just so much, so many more options with fingering weight yarn. First of all, there is a ton of beautiful hand dyed yarn available out there and it's usually fingering weight yarn. I also think that there are a much bigger variety of patterns available for fingering yarn. And you could also double up the fingering or even triple it up if you really wanted to. But the main reason that I would take fingering over chunky is that it's more affordable to buy a sweater's quantity of fingering versus a sweater's quantity of chunky. And that's because you get more yardage per gram in 
fingering weight yarn versus chunky yarn. What are your favorite local yarn stores? So funny enough, my favorite local yarn stores are all about an hour's away from me, but they're my favorite ones in the province. My, my favorite yarn stores are Have a Yarn in Mahone Bay, which luckily I get to visit pretty often because whenever we go visit Doyle's parents, we always stop in Mahone Bay. And the other ones are, they're one company, but they have two stores, is Gaspro Valley Fibers and their sister store, Wool and Tart. So Gaspro Valley Fibers is in Gaspro, Nova Scotia, which is in the Annapolis Valley. And Wool and Tart is in Wolfville, which is a town in the Annapolis Valley. So they're only about like maybe 15 minutes away from each other, but they offer completely different things. So the barn store offers a bit of a different selection than Wool and Tart in the town of Wolfville. So I like to go visit both because I'm gonna find something different in each one. Moving away from yarn and knitting, the next question is, what's your favorite guilty pleasure TV show or movie? Any and all Jane Austen adaptations. I love any adaptation of Jane Austen's work. I love reading the, the original stories, but I do prefer to watch it as an adaptation instead. And this is, this is where it's a guilty pleasure. I prefer the 2005 Kira Knightley, Matthew McFadden version of Pride and Prejudice than the 1995 Colin Firth, Jennifer Ely version. <laughs> I know it's not as close to the original story, but I just love that movie and I could watch it every single day and not get sick of it. Some of my other guilty pleasures are Great British Bake Off, which Doyle and I are on season 10 right now. I love, there's a movie that I love called I Capture the Castle. It stars Romola Garai and Rose Byrne. I, that's another movie that I could put it on every single day and not get sick of it. And just to throw you all for a loop, my other favorite guilty pleasure movie is The Fifth Element with Bruce Willis. I just love that movie. I think it's so funny. I always have a great time watching it. Chris Tucker is hilarious in that movie. And it's just so fun and crazy. So if you haven't watched that, I highly recommend it. What's your favorite dinosaur? My favorite dinosaur is Brachiosaurus. I love the long neck, especially in this cute little cartoon where it's a Brachiosaurus holding a stack of books and because it has a long neck, it can hold more books. I also hold all of my library books that way if I'm browsing in the library, so it would be handy to have an extra long neck to hold more books. Now this next question is a very serious question. What's your favorite Sarah J Maas series? Akatar. Answer is always Akatar. I love that series so much. It means so much to me. A Court of Mist and Fury is probably one of my favorite books of all time. And I just, I love the series so much. I love the characters. I love the plot. I love the world. I love everything about it. I also have a lot of Akatar paraphernalia. <laughs> you might be able to see I have a little tea light holder here with the night court symbol. I also have a necklace that Doyle gave me for Christmas last year. It has the symbol on the front. It has a quote on the back. Um, I also bought a lot of Red Door Fiber Studios Akatar yarn when she had that for sale. And also some of Explore Knits and Fibers. I was just taking in all the Akatar. <laughs> so that's my favorite of her series. Ooh, this is a fun question. Apart from where you are, where in the world would you love to live? So... I could see myself living in Vancouver, British Columbia, on the west coast of Canada. I lived there before when I was doing my master's and it's just such a beautiful place to live. You're surrounded by beautiful nature that's very easily accessible. It's got a great scene for like restaurants and bars and just general like city events, that kind of thing. So I really loved living out there. But I could also see myself living in Scotland. I visited in 2010 and I immediately felt at home, especially in Edinburgh. I love the city of Edinburgh, how historic it is. It's very similar to Halifax and, you know, well, Nova Scotia is New Scotland, so it would come as no surprise that I really enjoyed the real Scotland, <laughs> but it's just, it's such a beautiful country and it's got so much incredible nature and it's very wild, but also incredibly beautiful. Somebody asked me, I'd like to hear more about your job as a library technician. So for those of you who don't know, I work as a library technician as my full-time job, 
and I work for a government library. I absolutely love my job. I think it's really enjoyable because no day is ever the same. I have such a variety of tasks that I do. Um, and to point out, there is a difference between a librarian and a library technician. So a librarian deals more with like the managerial side of running a library. A library technician tends to deal more with the people that come into the library and the collection that's held by the library. I don't deal with patrons very often. I mainly work behind the scenes and my job is mainly to work on expanding the collection, cataloging new items, digitizing items to go into the collection. I work with our um, magazine subscriptions and newspaper subscriptions, work with our accounts. So I do a bit of math and, and I just love it because I do so many different things and there's always something exciting happening. Because we work closely um, with the government and everything, I'm watching history as it happens. I think that's really exciting and it's probably one of the coolest things about my job. But we're also a repository for like anything to do with Nova Scotia. So it's really cool because we see a lot of really interesting historic things too. And I just think it's really cool to be caretakers of all that information and it makes me feel like I'm doing a really important job. And you know, who doesn't love being surrounded by books all day, right? I was next asked a few questions about my partner, Doyle. I was asked, how long have you and Doyle been together? How did you and your partner meet? And could you and Doyle be any cuter? <laughs> Thank you so much. That's so sweet. So Doyle and I met in December of 2018. We met online. Uh, we met on the dating app Hinge, which their tagline is designed to be deleted. It was deleted in our case, so I guess the tagline works. I remember seeing Doyle's profile show up and I was immediately attracted to him because A, he's gorgeous. Uh, B, his photo featured him and his dog, and I'm a big dog lover. And then he had really good answers for the little icebreaker questions that they use on the app. I was super stoked when we matched. And I remember thinking when we matched, Oh my God, I have to get a date with this guy. I have to get a date with this guy. He just seems really, really amazing. And fortunately we started chatting. We seemed to have a, quite a bit in common and we decided to meet up. Now, if you've been online dating, you know that not everybody is as serious as others on those apps. And I remember that for our first date, Doyle wanted to go out to dinner. And I knew that that was a good sign because most of my dates were coffee dates or meet up for a drink. And it was just sort of like a getting to know you kind of date. But Doyle immediately like wanted a serious date. And that I was so excited about that because I, I liked this guy so much. And basically from the first time that I met him on our date, I was thinking to myself, there, there's something about him. He, he's the one like he I don't know why it happened that quickly but it just clicked and obviously he felt the same way because he proposed in November <laughs> so uh, we've been together for about two and a half years and we've been engaged for about six months I love him so much he's just he's perfect he is exactly the right partner that I want in life and I just feel so lucky and so honored to be in such a wonderful relationship. So, there's the answer to that question. So Laura, could we be any cuter? Uh, you tell me. <laughs> Following in the same vein of questions about my life, how's Rooster doing? We haven't seen him in a while. So Rooster's doing good. Um, he's quite a lot bigger than the last time you saw him on the podcast. I'll try and put a video in here of what he's up to and what he's doing. So, 
like I mentioned when we first got him, Rooster is a rescue, which means that, you know, he's got a little bit of emotional baggage. He has his, his hang-ups and he has his weird idiosyncrasies, but we try to just roll with them and, um, you know, we still love him so much. It's just sometimes he can be a handful and sometimes it can be frustrating to deal with, but we love him so much and, you know, we're... We're doing everything we can to give him the best life that he can have. Now, I really liked this next question. I thought it was really interesting. If you had to get a tattoo of something, what would it be? So, some people might not know this, but I actually already have four tattoos. I have them in various places, but, you know, I'm just keeping that to myself. I don't really want to just share that everywhere on YouTube. Um, but I will say that... My next tattoo is going to be a wedding tattoo with Doyle. We haven't decided what we want to get, and we haven't decided where we'll get it yet, um, but we'll get those at some point. Now, my next batch of questions are really interesting questions. I was really glad to get these ones. I think they're really good ones to talk about, especially because I am a plus-size knitter. My first sort of like plus-size knitting-related question is, what are your go-to sweater modifications? I love this question. This is a really good question. Um, cause everybody's, every body is different and everyone likes different things. So for me, I have two go-to modifications that I do for almost every single sweater that I've ever knit. The first one is I always modify my necklines. I find crew necks to be almost choking. I find them way too high and sometimes they're really tight. And I've usually been very uncomfortable when I've knit a pattern to the recommended neckline. Now it's very easy to modify this if you're doing a top-down sweater. I haven't yet figured out how to do it with a bottom-up sweater. So to modify the neckline to make it larger when doing a top-down sweater is easy. I always start with the number of stitches after the first set of increases. And I do whatever the normal neckline instructions were. So if it's a ribbed neckline, I'll do the ribbing and then I'll move on to whatever the second increase is. And that's where I follow the pattern to the letter afterwards. So it's a super easy modification to do, especially if you find a lot of sweaters are too high on your neck or too uncomfortable. And I think I've done that with almost every sweater I've ever knit. And I don't mind having a wider neckline. Um, sometimes it's irritating if I need to wear like a, a shirt underneath and you see the shirt. Um, but I usually find a way to make it work. My other modification that I always do is I almost always make the sweaters longer in the body. So that's because I have a very round belly and I also have very round boobs. And both of those things take the length of your sweater and pull it up and up and up because you need to have more fabric going outwards. Um, so for me, I find that unless I'm knitting a purposely cropped sweater, I always need to add maybe an inch or two to the length and that's just because I don't like having my sweaters end like right at my pants line. I like them to end a few inches past that because I never want to be out and about and I have the gap between the bottom of my sweater and the top of my jeans. I just find that very uncomfortable, which again is a super easy modification. All you need to do is just keep knitting and just knit past whatever the recommended length is for the pattern. I usually find that if you're doing a top-down sweater, you just try it on when you're happy with the length, bind off then. Um, if you're doing a bottom-up sweater, it's a little trickier, but it's not impossible. So again, it's just try it on your body, see if you like where it is. Um, if you're doing like a bottom-up raglan, it's pretty simple because your raglan's gonna start where your armpits are. So you just pull up your sweater till it reaches your armpits. If you like the length, then you're done, keep going do the rest of the sweater instructions. The next question is, would you eventually like to make your all your own garments, knitting and sewing? So, if you'd have asked me this last year, I probably would have said yes, but I'm a little more hesitant now, and that's because I've had my sewing machine for about a year and a half, and I've realized that I'm not very good at sewing. I'm great when it comes to sewing straight seams, such as with all my project bags, which is why I've made a lot of project bags, because I find them pretty easy to sew, because they're all straight lines. 
But when it comes to sewing anything on a curve or anything complicated like shoulder seams or setting in a sleeve, I find that really challenging and I haven't yet had something work out. But I'm in the process of sewing a skirt right now and I'm feeling pretty confident about the skirt because the skirt is only straight lines. And I think that that's what's gonna work for me. So my goal is to eventually be able to sew the items of clothing that I find the most difficult to get to fit me properly. And that would be mainly pants. Pants are the things that I find hard to, hard to fit me properly, or I just don't like what's available for my size. I have always dreamed of having the perfect pair of wide leg trousers like Katherine Hepburn. I've just always been enthralled by this style of pants. And it's something that's very difficult to find in plus size. And again, once you find it in plus size, it's very difficult to find it to fit you properly. So I'm 5'7", but I have a long torso and short legs. So when I go into a plus size store and I find a pair of wide leg pants, they are usually about six inches too long. And that makes it difficult to hem them because I'm gonna lose that beautiful wide leg shape. So it is on my list to make a pair of these pants at some point. I have a really great pattern. I think they're called the Calder Pants by Cashmereette. And I think that these will work for me. I just haven't gotten the confidence to try and sew them yet. Um, and when it comes to knitting my own garments, I think I've talked a bit about how one of my goals for my knitting lately has been to try and knit more versatile items for my wardrobe. So things that I could wear to work, that I could wear on a date, that I could wear going to meet a friend for coffee, like more than just cozy stay at home sweaters. Um, I also need to get into making cardigans because I wear a lot of cardigans. <laughs> There's a really cute meme out there that says cardigans are the lab coats of library science. Um, and I take my science very seriously. So I need my lab coats. Thank you very much. <laughs> and I actually have never knit a cardigan for myself. Uh, so I'd like to start doing those soon. That's on my list of things to make. Speaking of my list of things to make, I was asked, do you have a knitting queue or do you decide what's next from project to project? What's been on your queue the longest and what is the pattern you're most excited to cast on next? So to answer your question, yes, I do have a knitting queue. It is about 50 patterns long at this point, And I do have yarn for most of those patterns. Um, but I don't necessarily stick to my queue pattern by pattern by pattern. Because like I mentioned before, I'm a magpie. I am attracted by tons of different things and I'm always finding something new that catches my interest. And I blame Instagram a lot for that because I'll see pictures of patterns that people have made or a new pattern that's come out or a test knit that's happening. And I'll say, yes, I wanna do that. <laughs> and it'll sort of like put my cue in the back of my brain and kind of like focus on this new thing. I am trying to focus more on getting through that queue and getting through that list of things that I want to make because they're on my list for a reason. I wanted to make them at some point and I still want to make them for the most part. Now the item that has been on my queue the longest has been on it for over three years at this point and it is the Dream Lake Shawl by Julie Decker and I'll include a picture here. I love this pattern so much and I found the perfect yarn for it at a yarn store in Nova Scotia it is prairie spun DK yarn and it is 100% non superwash wool. It's the colors are stunning. I absolutely love them. It's just a little bit rustic, not really rustic. So I feel like I would get a lot of warmth out of it, but I wouldn't get too much itch, which I'm happy about. But I love the color scheme that I have. The reason I haven't knit this shawl is I have to do a bit of rejigging with this pattern because the size that I want to make only uses three colors of yarn and I have four and I want to use my colors all together because I fell in love with them in the store because I loved them all together. So I have actually like drawn out a schematic of how to do the different colors. I'm just nervous to start it and realize 
oh, that's not going to work out or, oh, no, I'm running out of this color that I plan to use at this point. What am I going to do? So I'm just kind of nervous of it not working out. So that's kind of why I've just kind of like, I'll do that next year. I'll do that next year. And the years just keep piling up. So I I don't think I'll get to it this year, but maybe it'll be on my list for next year. I'm not sure. But it's on my queue because I am going to knit that at some point. I just haven't yet. But what is at the top of my queue is Doyle's engagement sweater, which you've heard me talk about this before, but I'll mention it again. It's the Montrealer by Designs by Dells. And I am knitting this using Red Door Fiber Studios Akatar yarn in the colors for Resand, which are purple, which is Doyle's favorite color. So it's going to look stunning for him. I'm so excited to knit this pattern for Doyle because he loves knitted hoodies and I just think these colors are going to look stunning on him and we're going to look so cute in our engagement photo. I'm so excited. So the next question is a really good question. What clues do you look for in a pattern that will tell you it will work well for your body type? So the first thing that I do first and foremost is I look at the size range of the pattern. Am I within the size range or am I at the cap of the size range? Or is there even a size that will work for me? I generally prefer patterns where I fit inside the size range, not at the cap of the size range, because that tells me that the, that the designer has taken into account more sizes than me. So I'm typically a 2X, which yes, it's a plus size, but it's generally one of the smaller plus sizes. So I try to pick patterns where that's not one of the end sizes of the size range. I also then look and see, did anybody my size make this pattern? And if someone has made it or if it's been tested in that size, generally I know it's probably gonna work well for me. Um, something else that I look at, if it does not have a project made by somebody my size, is did anybody who has a similar body shape to me make it? Because even if someone is, let's say, a size medium, if they also have large breasts and a curvy shape, it might work for me as well. If the only people that have made it have very thin, athletic, or slim builds, mm, I might still make it, but I am going to be prepared to possibly have to frog it, rework it, um, start off again in a different size, something along those lines. So that's actually the case of my Augustine's number 21 dress. When I went to make that, I didn't see anybody larger than a size medium that had made it and shared photos of it on their body. So that was a risk that I took when I knit that pattern, but I was a, it was a confident risk because the designer had made an extensive size range where I was not the end size, I was one of the middle sizes. So that gave me confidence that it was going to work for me. As for like looking at clues in the pattern itself, I generally look for patterns where the designer has gone with either numbered sizing or measured sizing. So for example, sizes one, two, three, four, or 34 inch bust, 36 inch bust, 38 inch bust, something like that. I don't typically find that patterns that go by standard sizes, small, medium, large, extra large, 2X, 3X, I generally find that those ones don't fit as well. Um, I, don't, I don't know if it's, if there's a reason why, but that's just what I've found in my own experience. Um, I also look to see what does the designer look like? If the designer has a curvy body, generally speaking, it's probably gonna work for me because a designer will usually knit their sample to fit themselves and then they'll grade based on that sample. So, Typically, I kind of take that as a good omen that it's going to work well for me. I also look into a pattern to see, does it use um, row counts or does it use inch measurements for your instructions? If a pattern tells me knit 50 rows and then do this, I don't think that's going to work as well for me as if someone said, knit five inches and then do this. And that's because row gauge is different for everybody. And I like having the option to just knit until it meets a measurement. 
because then I know that it's not just tailored to one size and one row gauge. It's something that people have thought, okay, when it reaches this point on your body, then you do the next instruction. So I find that that works well for me. I hope that helps. Now, the next question is probably one of my favorite questions that I got, and it's any tips for designers when making designs size inclusive? So yes, I do have a few tips for you. The very first one is don't use Craft Yarn Council standard sizes. They are woefully insufficient. The one that you should use instead, which I have learned from Penrose Knits, is called Sister Mountain. And I will include a link to their size chart in the description below because it's a really great resource. They have measurements for parts of your body that Yarn Council can, that Craft Yarn Council doesn't even think of. So for example, my wrist. You wouldn't think that that's something that you might need to know the measurements for, but if you're doing a sweater, long sleeved, that requires very snug sleeves, I think you're gonna wanna know what the wrist measurement is for different sizes, right? So that would be my first tip. My second one is don't just add more stitches and more rows and call it a day. What you need to do is you need to take into account that not every part of your body changes at the same rate. So for example, my wrist is not significantly larger than the wrist of somebody who is a size small, but my bust is significantly bigger than their bust. So you don't just want to add tons and tons of stitches because then I might get a body that fits me right, but I might have a sleeve that's just dangling off my wrist because it's too big. So you need to take into account that not every part of your pattern needs to increase the same number of stitches as other parts, which can get very challenging. I don't know enough about pattern design and grading to give you more accurate information than that, but I do recommend checking out the Sister Mountain um, webpage to learn a bit more about grading. They talk a bit more, they talk more about it. And my third tip is once you get into testing, your testers are gold because they are going to give you all the feedback you need to make your design perfect. Now, keeping that in mind, you need to be prepared as a designer to pause and take into account any feedback they might give you when you're partially through a test knit. And you need to be prepared to go back to your pattern, go back to the drawing board, adjust that pattern, and bring it back to your testers to then try out the new instructions. And above all, please, please, please give your larger testers more time to test than smaller testers because we have a lot more stitches and a lot more rows that we need to knit than someone who's making a size small. And there's nothing that fills me with more joy than seeing a test knit have rolling deadlines. So for example, um, my most recent one, the souffle tee, had different deadlines depending on whether you were doing short sleeves or long sleeves and whether you were doing one of the straight sizes or one of the plus sizes. So for example, the earliest deadline was for a straight size short sleeve. The next deadline was for plus size short sleeve or straight size long sleeve. And the last deadline was for plus size long sleeve. And let me tell you, it fills me with so much joy to see that in a test because it means that the designer respects the fact that it's going to take me longer to knit a pattern than it will someone who is a smaller size than me. When you do start doing your test, listen to your testers. I think there's nothing more unacceptable than testing your design and then not accepting the feedback of your testers. That's both extremely rude, but also a complete waste of a tester's time if you're not going to take their feedback into account. The next question is, were you nervous to start your YouTube channel and how did you decide to do a YouTube channel? So I had been thinking about doing a YouTube channel for a little while. Um, back in fall of 2020, I started my knitting specific Instagram account and I was really enjoying carving out that really welcoming corner of the internet for myself. I really loved that. It was always very positive. I only saw knitting content because I only followed 
other knitters or crocheters or yarn companies, anything fiber related, I was usually just focused on that. And I started my Instagram account because I wanted to focus on my photography and I wanted to increase my motivation for knitting. And when I was finishing up patterns, I would do finished object photos, but it kind of ended there. I didn't really get to share a lot about my experiences knitting the pattern other than like a few lines in an Instagram post. Um, I also didn't really get to show off the item. So I started off first by doing a reel of an item and that's my Radiate sweater by Hohi Locatelli. And I loved doing the reel because I could show off the pattern in full view, 360, show how it fits on my body and everything. And then I thought, well, instead of just showing it, I should probably talk about this too. So I thought to myself, as I was doing this reel, I wanted the opportunity to talk about the pattern and talk about my experiences of knitting it as a plus size person. Because I've been following some knitting podcasters for a while, and I thought, I don't see a lot of plus size knitting podcasters. And at the time, I struggled to find any just by doing a search on YouTube. I have since found some plus size knitting podcasters, um, mainly through my own channel or through doing test nets together. So I know a few more now. Um, but at the time I thought, this is a space that needs to be filled. And if nobody else is doing it, why don't I do it? So that's a little nerve wracking, but at the same time, I just kind of felt that it was important to do. And I felt very energized by the thought of doing it myself. Um, obviously I don't use any fancy equipment. I watched YouTube videos to learn how to make a YouTube video learned about some software that I could use, learned how to include pictures, learned how to include text, um, music, that kind of thing. Um, as of this episode, I also now have a proper microphone. Um, Doyle insisted on getting me a good quality microphone for my podcast. So thank you, Doyle. Um, so I'm just sort of slowly building up my arsenal of things that help me with my channel, but in general, it's pretty, pretty easy. It's pretty simple. Um, I sit and talk to you about what I knit. <laughs> um, and I knew right away that doing the standard, um, knitting podcast formula was not going to work for me. So the standard formula is what am I wearing? Finished objects, whips, and acquisitions. And that didn't work for me because first of all, I'm a monogamous knitter. I only work on one thing at a time. I'm also a really slow knitter. So I didn't want to be doing a podcast like every two weeks or every month saying, here's the same sweater I've been working on for three episodes. Look, I've got a couple more inches. I just didn't think that that would be good content. And I also didn't think that that was the kind of content that I wanted to put out there. So I thought about reviewing patterns instead because I felt that it was important to talk about the patterns that I make as a plus size knitter so that other plus size knitters could see, oh, that's what that project looks like on somebody my size or somebody similar to my size. Um, and then I also talked about like some of the issues that I run into as a plus size knitter, um, such as fit or being at the cap of the size range for a pattern, that type of thing. And I felt that it was really important information to talk about and share and to also just show that plus size knitters are out here and we're just as great as people who are straight sized and we look just as beautiful in patterns as straight sized people do. And I liked having the platform of YouTube to sort of share those thoughts and share my own experiences as a plus size knitter. So that's kind of how I decided to have a YouTube channel. Was I nervous to start it? Uh, when I was in the planning stages, not so much, but when it came to recording my first video, <laughs> I did two completely full run throughs without even turning my camera on because, and by camera, I mean my phone because I record on my phone. And <laughs> I did two full, I did those two full run throughs. And even then I had to stop and start 
three times once I turned the camera on because I kept making mistakes. Now I have since learned that it's pretty simple for me to edit out those mistakes. And now I just sort of keep going if I make a mistake because I know I can just snip that out because my editing software is fairly simple to use. And I do it all on my phone. I don't have any fancy editing software on my computer. I don't have a fancy camera. I'm just using bare bones stuff. Like this mic is the fanciest thing that I have for my podcast right now. Um, I don't know if one day I'll get other fancy things, but I'm pretty happy with just the phone. I think it works really great. And you know, you tell me, what do you think the videos look like? Are they really good quality? Are you happy with them? I hope so. Um, and I'm still nervous when I do my videos sometimes. Like, for example, I am doing my complete second run through of this video because I didn't like how I did my first take. And this is my 10th video. It's not always easy. Um, sometimes it is. Sometimes I do an episode and I know exactly what I want to say and I say it exactly the way that I had in my mind and I get everything done properly. But then there's other times where I mess up all the time. And sometimes that happens and I just have to roll with it and it's fine. We're getting to the end now. The next question is what's your dream project or what's your dream knitting pattern? So I'm actually gonna be making one of my dream projects very soon. I mentioned earlier that I'm making a sweater for Doyle for our engagement pictures. I'm also gonna be making a sweater for myself. Um, like I said that I was in love with Red Door Fiber Studios Akatar yarn, I also fell in love with Explorer Knits Akatar yarn, and I bought both of her Akatar colors, one of which is Court of Dreams, which is this beautiful mix of teal and purple. I'm gonna be using that and some sparkly white yarn to make the Astraea sweater by Bad Wolf Girl Knits, which I'm super excited to make for myself. I'm also a little nervous because it's quite an involved color work sweater project. So it'll be a challenge for me, but I think it's gonna turn out beautiful. I'm gonna get Doyle's pattern done first because I've been promising him a sweater since we got engaged. So I'm, I'm, I'm about six months late at this point. So his pattern will be the next one that I work on. And then I'm gonna do mine probably over the summertime. So that's the one that's actually going to happen. But I also have a couple dream projects that I don't know if they'll actually ever happen, if I'll ever knit them, but they're still dream projects in my head. So the first one would be any sort of really intense color work project. So some of my favorite ones are the Chotten mittens, which I'll put right here. Um, the bookshelf sweater. Oh, I love this pattern so much or the book lover blanket. I love this pattern, it's so pretty, but it's really intense. Don't know if I'll ever make it, but I love the look of it. So that would be like my first sort of dream project would be something that was really intensely color work like those. One of my other dream projects that I would love to make is a cropped peplum jacket following one of Kim Hargreaves patterns, but unfortunately I'm outside of her size range so those would include needing to do some math and maybe use a different yarn and needle size to get it to fit me right and I, I just don't know if I want to do that. It's a lot of work to do that kind of stuff so I don't think I'm really up for that challenge right now. And probably my other dream project, this is like an absolute dream project, would be to do a felted wool coat, kind of like a princess style. And I've always wanted a coat like that. And I love the idea of making it myself and felting it. But again, that's a lot of work. And when it comes to doing a felting project, you are never going to know that, it, that it's not working out until you've already done all the work and you're starting to felt it. And then it's a lost cause. So I'm kind of nervous about that but it is something that's on my dream list. And now we come to my last question. I've saved this to the end because it's gonna require a bit of a longer response. And I was asked what my summer reading list is. So I don't actually usually, I usually don't make a list of summer reads. Um, I read all year round. I don't actually have specific styles of books that I read at different seasons. Um, I totally understand if people do. Um, it's, that's not the kind of reader that I am, but I can tell you 
a few books that I do want to read. One of my goals this year is actually to read more books that I have not read because last year I did a lot of rereads because I was looking for a lot of comfort reading. So I actually printed off a list this year. It's the 52 Book Club's 2022 Reading Challenge, 52 books in 52 weeks. I am not reading 52 books in 52 weeks, but I'm using some of their prompts to sort of guide my reading choices. So I've already read a few and I've made some notes as well, which obviously you can't read because it's very, very tiny. But I just wanted to point out that I did um, pick up this list. I'll link this below so that you can see what the prompts are yourself, see if they interest you. But I have five books here that I'm going to share and talk to you about that I want to read sometime this year. So the first one is a book I've been meaning to read for quite a while. It's The Secret Diary of Lizzie Bennet. So this is a novelization of the YouTube series The Lizzie Bennet Diaries, which I love this series so much. It's one of the most interesting adaptations I've ever seen, not just of a Jane Austen work, but of any work. So I, I got the book once it came out and I've been meaning to read this for quite a while. And I think this is the year to read it because this year is the 10th anniversary of the Lizzie Bennet Diaries. So that will probably be on my list of things to read this year. The next one is called Miss You by Kate Eberlin. I picked this up at a used bookstore, loved the concept, it was really, really neat. Um, it reminded me of the book One Day by David Nichol, and I haven't read the book, I've only seen the movie. Um, it's a really touching movie. But the premise of this book is that it's two teenagers that seem to meet up every so often, and it sort of like explores their lives. And it just like seemed like a really cute story and I was really interested to see how that story would, would play out. So that's my second book. My next one is The Flight of Gemma Hardy by Margot Livesey or Livesey. Don't quite know how to pronounce that last name, I'm sorry. Um, and this is a Jane Eyre retelling, a modern Jane, modern day Jane Eyre retelling. And those are always really interesting for, for me. I love reading those. So I'm excited about that one. And then my next two are both fantasy. Uh, I want to read The Witch's Blade, which is the sequel to The High Mountain Court that I just finished recently and that I talked about in my souffle tea video. So definitely excited to read the sequel to that. And then my last book that I would like to read is From Blood and Ash by Jennifer L. Armentrout. Anyone who is into... A Court of Thorns and Roses. This is by and large recommended as similar reading when you finish those books. So I finished those books a while ago. I've reread them a couple of times. I've never read um, the Blood and Ash series, but I think this is the year for me to get into it. So those are some of my books that I want to read this summer or just this year in general. I hope you enjoyed all of my answers to your questions. Thank you so much for sending in such interesting questions. I had a lot of fun answering them and I hope you had fun watching and listening to my answers. If you did, give it a like. Remember, if you wanna enter the giveaway, comment below and include the words 1K giveaway in your comment. If you're a new viewer, thank you so much for joining me. And if you're a returning viewer, thank you so much for coming back. I really appreciate it. And there is not much else to say except thank you so much. Everyone, take care. Bye.